So we have this huge unrecognized issue that really uh, needs to be uh, aired. We need to really get our arms around the fact that many of the diseases that are so prevalent today are diet related. Who knew? Uh, you know, that was talked about just the other day by Dr. Hippocrates. What was that? Over 2,000 years ago. When we live in a country where there are 28 million diabetics, and by and large, this is a choice. You choose to become diabetic really based upon what you choose to eat. And from my perspective as a practicing neurologist, this is a powerful re relationship to Alzheimer's disease. When you're a type 2 diabetic, you've doubled your risk for Alzheimer's. That's a disease for which there is no treatment. It's a disease affecting 5.4 million Americans as we have this conversation. And it's a disease that's paralleling the explosive rise in diabetes. It is a preventable situation. Choose not to become diabetic, choose to eat carefully, and you dramatically reduce your risk of, of losing your marbles, of becoming an Alzheimer's patient. It's a challenging situation, Alzheimer's. It's costing us $200 billion a year to care for these people. And the sobering part of the discussion is it's a preventable disease, uh, that, and nobody seems to be talking about that. You know, again, uh, dealing with uh, Alzheimer's is going to break the bank. So $200 billion a year, according to a recent RAND report published in the New England Journal of Medicine, is twice what we're spending annually to deal with heart disease. It's triple what we're spending on dealing with cancer. And, you know, the projections are that by the year 2030, that number, 5.4 million Americans, is predicted to double. And again, this relates specifically to diet. Dr. Deborah Barnes, University of California in San Francisco, has indicated that about 54% of Alzheimer's cases could have been prevented. And by and large, the biggest variable here is what's on the end of your fork, what is on your plate. So no one wants to talk about preventive medicine as it relates to the brain, and it's tragic because it's a tragic situation, not from a monetary perspective as much as it is from an emotional perspective for those families having to deal with mom or dad who no longer can remember their name. And I will say that from a personal perspective, that's the situation that I'm in. So I deal with that every morning in meeting with my father, a former brilliant brain surgeon who now may or may not remember my name. And then I walk across the parking lot and go to my office and I deal with patients asking why did this happen? And perhaps more importantly, in, in terms of what we're talking about, what can I do to prevent this situation from happening to me, knowing that I have a risk. And that is you've got to get the carbs out of your diet. I don't think I could say it any clearer. You've got to get the carbs out of your diet. You've got to lower your blood sugar in so doing and reduce your risk for this disease. Now, in August of 2013, published in the New England Journal of Medicine, was a very compelling study. What did it tell us? It showed us that individuals with a blood sugar of 105, 110, uh, which most doctors would say, oh, that's not a problem. You're not even pre-diabetic. Don't worry about it. Those levels of blood sugar already translate to a dramatic risk for developing dementia, a situation for which there is no cure. We control our blood sugar based upon our consumption of sugar and carbohydrates. There's no mystery there. We've got to welcome back as a source of calories and obviously nutrients, fat. Fat is your friend. Your brain loves fat. And we'll talk about what that means in terms of the types of fats, but let me just re reiterate that the brain needs fat. And if you have lots of fat in your diet, you reduce your risk of becoming an Alzheimer's patient. A study published January 2012 in the Journal of Alzheimer's Disease, a report from the Mayo Clinic, showed that elderly individuals who eat the most fat have a 47% risk reduction for developing dementia. Those who eat the highest amount of carbohydrates have an 89% increased risk for becoming demented. 
that's powerful stuff that we need to talk about. That's stuff that the public needs to become aware of because right now, what the public is getting is basically eat whatever you want, eat the fast food, eat whatever's around, live your life come what may, and then when you walk into a room and you don't know why, when you can't find your keys or remember the Wi-Fi code, or as I like to say, when you become mentally one taco short of a combo platter, platter, uh, you'll have a pill, there'll be something wonderful for you. Let's be clear. There is no treatment for Alzheimer's disease as we have this conversation. Uh, and who knows if that'll ever happen. But it is preventable. And it's really time people understand that the ball is hit across the net back into your court as a consumer. That you've got to make the changes right now, the dietary and lifestyle changes that will reduce your risk of becoming diabetic, that focus on a low carbohydrate diet, and again, as a neurologist, I want people to understand this has a huge role to play in reducing your risk for dementia. By far and away, uh, the, the most important issue that is going on uh, these days that's contributing to our devastating health issues with respect to any manner of neurodegenerative condition, be it uh, Alzheimer's or even, you know, frankly with children and ADHD, as well as degenerative conditions uh, in general, things like cardiovascular disease, diabetes, and even cancer, relates very specifically to the amount of carbohydrate in the diet these days. Uh, carbohydrates are wonderful foods in that they are portable, they have a long shelf life. Uh, basically, carbs and grains and flour have allowed uh, the exploration of the world, but it's our downfall. And what a sobering uh, notion it is that for the first time in the history of America, the lifespan of our children will be less than ours. What have we done? And I would submit that we haven't changed genetically. That takes 70 to 80,000 years to happen. We've changed the epigenetic factors, those factors that influence gene expression, and primarily uh, expression of genes based upon the foods that we choose to eat. So it's been this invasion of our diet by carbohydrates that has been so devastating to our health uh, that we're all witnessing now. And, you know, the notion uh, of the importance of going low fat and no fat has been an absolute perversion uh, in uh, the nu nutritional recommendations that we've all received. So, you know, when you look at the food pyramid, that is the foundation are the whole grain goodness uh, of breads and pastas and cereals and at the very top of the food pyramid was this tiny little bottle of olive oil. In light of all of the research coming out about how important fat is and especially olive oil, we've really got to just take the food pyramid and turn it upside down and recognize again that fat is so fundamentally important for human health and longevity and resistance to any number of diseases and really it's the way humans have eaten for a couple of million years. So it's, it's the carbs. It's all about the carbs. And unfortunately, you know, this has become the cornerstone of Western culture in terms of nutrition. So we, we fully understand that humans have an absolute requirement for a certain amount of fat uh, in the diet. Otherwise, we'll have health consequences, which we are seeing now as a consequence not only of the perversion of the fats, the changes that have occurred in the fats, but also this low-fat, no-fat doctrine that so many people have adopted. Uh, and beyond that, we have a, a, a certain amount of uh, calories that have to come from protein. Uh, that we require for uh, amino acids then to do the things that the amino acids do in our physiology, not the least of which is to then build protein in our physiology. Surprising fact is that the human requirement for carbohydrate is absolutely zero. We require no carbohydrates whatsoever. And that is, you know, fact. And when you hear pushback from uh, interests in the nutrition world that are not always uh, objective, they'll, they'll tell you that, well, you know, you require a certain amount of so-called good carbohydrates in your diet. And I wonder why. And they'll, typically, you know, as a neurologist, they'll say, well, you know, that glucose is what you need for your brain. Well, 
It doesn't work that way. When you need glucose from your, for your brain, you have glycogen storage uh, that you can tap into. Uh, you've got gluconeogenesis, which is the manufacturing of sugar uh, from amino acids, from protein breakdown. And by and large, what we are seeing that is so exciting is that the super fuel for the brain happens to be fat. So even these days, we see a medical food that you can buy with a prescription to treat Alzheimer's disease, uh, which is really based upon this understanding that the brain thrives on a fat-rich environment. So one of the most important chemicals for the human brain, serving as a precursor for vitamin D, the precursor for progesterone, estrogen, testosterone, cortisol, and even acting as a brain antioxidant is, oddly enough, cholesterol. So uh, cholesterol has been so castigated all over the years, the decades that we've been told it's our enemy. Cholesterol is absolutely the friend of the brain. Cholesterol is a desperately important chemical for human physiology. Every cell in your body needs cholesterol. Uh, cholesterol became vilified because we suddenly had a way to lower it and then there was the, the Framingham study that uh, when you look at the data, had really nothing to do with cholesterol, but was spun in such a way that we suddenly began to understand that cholesterol was playing this pivotal role in heart disease. Nothing is further from the truth. We talked about uh, LDL being bad cholesterol. Let's talk about that for just a moment because LDL, number one, isn't cholesterol, it's a protein, low density lipoprotein. It's a carrier of cholesterol and its job is to take desperately needed cholesterol around the body and deliver it to where it's needed most. It also d delivers uh, other, as other parts of uh, the chemistry uh, like um, triglycerides, for example, where they're desperately needed. So the castigation of LDL being bad cholesterol, because again we could lower it with drugs, is, uh, the, I think the scientific term would be bonkers. It makes no sense at all. Now, that said, when LDL becomes oxidized or damaged by the action of what are called free radicals, that definitely becomes an issue. Oxidized LDL dramatically relates to risk of coronary artery disease, for example. So what is it then that oxidizes LDL? And the thing that's really getting a lot of attention these days is a process called glycation. When LDL gets glycated, it means it's bound to sugar. When LDL glycates, it becomes oxidized. We can lower the rate at which LDL oxidizes by lowering the, weight, the, uh, the rate at which it becomes glycated, meaning keeping the blood sugar lower. And that's why uh, laboratories these days are measuring oxidized uh, LDL. And we can get a sense as to the level of oxidized LDL, somewhat indirectly, but still very good correlation, by looking at a very commonly performed blood test called A1C. Now, diabetics know all about A1C. It represents an average blood sugar over a three to four month period of time. But beyond that, it is a glycated protein uh, as well it's glycated, meaning sugar bound, to hemoglobin. So the formal name for A1C is hemoglobin A1C, measuring the rate at which sugar is bound to hemoglobin. How much sugar binds to hemoglobin reflects how much sugar will bind to LDL and oxidize it. So I think it's important to understand that when you look at an LDL level, which I will add dramatically correlates with risk for uh, brain degeneration, it's a measurement of this process it's an indirect but very good correlation with the level of oxidation of LDL, and that is very important. But keep in mind that elderly individuals, for example, who have the highest cholesterol levels have about a 70% risk reduction for developing dementia. So again, uh, cholesterol is our friend. It, it's God gave us cholesterol, or nature gave us cholesterol, because it's so fundamentally important for human health. So we, we understand fully that the cornerstone player in vascular disease is a process called inflammation. And really there's no relationship between cholesterol and inflammation aside from the fact that when the arterial lining, what we call the endothelium, becomes damaged by becoming oxidized, 
then cholesterol appears on the scene to help put the fire out. So it's like blaming uh, the fire on the fire chief and the fire team that comes to the firemen that are put there to put the fire out. Cholesterol is not the cause of the inflammation, it's actually the body's response. And let me take that a little bit further because perhaps a little bit surprising would be the idea that Alzheimer's disease is an inflammatory condition, in this case, of the brain. It is primarily inflammatory, just like coronary artery diseases, just like diabetes and cancer are related to inflammation. So we've got to do everything we can to reduce inflammation. When we glycate our proteins, when sugar binds to proteins, it does two things it dramatically upregulates or turns on the production of damaging chemicals called free radicals, and it also dramatically turns on the process of inflammation. The cornerstone of Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, coronary artery disease, diabetes, and even cancer. So this is really yet another reason, uh, a powerful argument in favor of reducing our consumption of carbohydrates getting our blood sugars not in the normal level, but into the optimal level, and reducing inflammation and therefore free radical production. And I think what's really surprising is the misconception uh, that, you know, being so-called in shape, having uh, the right, uh, you know, being not overweight, that you're free to eat whatever you want and everything's going to be just fine. And nothing is further from the truth because we see plenty of uh, individuals who look great, whose uh, body mass index is in the normal range, who don't have excessive body fat, and yet they're already in trouble and they don't know it because their diets are such that they are already changing their proteins by having too much sugar in the bloodstream. They're already developing a fatty liver because they're eating a lot of fructose, for example. So we're all over looking at certain laboratory studies that are very predictive in determining risk for developing diabetes uh, and how far along on the continuum a person may already be. And we surprise a lot of our patients when their laboratory studies come back and indicate, for example, that their A1C, which is a measurement of their average blood sugar, might be 5.7, 5.8. Now, that may raise some eyebrows because people say, gee, that's my A1C and my doctor said it's fine. It's not fine. You're already in the second highest category for developing uh, brain shrinkage at those levels. We need to drive the average blood sugar down to a level of around 5 to 5.2, maybe even 4.8. The next metric that is really important is blood sugar. Again, people get a pat on the back when their blood sugar is 100 to 105. We now know, based upon well-respected current literature, that those levels are not satisfactory. While they may be average, you know, average represents what's common. They're anything but optimal. And let me throw one more metric into the, uh, the list of things people should consider asking their doctors for, and that is a fasting insulin level. And let me take a step back. When you consume glucose, consume sugars, or consume even complex carbohydrates, that your body then breaks down into glucose, blood sugar rises, your pancreas secretes insulin to help get rid of the sugar, drive it into the cells. Well, what happens is after you've challenged your pancreas enough over the years, uh, you need to secrete, your pancreas will secrete higher and higher levels of insulin because the signal of insulin to drive it into the cells, drive sugar into the cells becomes uh, less effective and you become uh, early stage what we call insulin resistant. And this is the harbinger for actually becoming a diabetic. Now you won't know that you're on that scale until you have a fasting insulin level checked. Now normally, uh, if you look at the lab, they'll say, well, a normal fasting insulin level is up to 26 uh, uh, nanograms per milliliter. If your fasting insulin level is that high, you're already in deep trouble. You should have a fasting insulin level ideally less than two, but four, six, or maybe eight are levels that would indicate you're in fairly good control. So that predicts where you're going to go in the future. And oftentimes people come in, you know, they're going to the gym, uh, they're eating their carbs because they're able to, they think, work them off. But this whole uh, feed forward process of increasing insulin and ultimately leading to insulin resistance 
uh, is already well underway and you won't know it until you get those laboratory studies and then a lot of people become surprised and it's good because they become fearful and then we're able to have this conversation say look you're already on your way to trouble the time to act the time to fix the roof is now when the sun is shining those are the words of John Kennedy from his inaugural address and that's I use that quote a lot because for many of my patients who I'm seeing for preventive medicine the sun is still shining and we can keep it that way You know, when I go to the gym, uh, I have to say that it's, uh, it, it always is uh, mystifying to me the n number of people who are out of shape who are just pounding that treadmill day in and day out, you know, for an hour at a time or on the elliptical machine and thinking that they're going to somehow work off, uh, you know, this pounding of g carbohydrate breakfast that they may have started their day with. It doesn't work that way. You know, you, you can't work off those carbs. And even if you've burned uh, the same number of calories, if that were possible, from your high carb breakfast, still, prior to your workout, you've already challenged your pancreas and gone through this whole uh, issue of secreting insulin and ultimately making your cells more insulin resistant. So understand that the notion of carb loading is something humans have never done. Humans are, by nature, endurance athletes. As a hunter-gatherer, before we had any technology of throwing spears and developing that technology, we basically, what we did was we chased the animal until it dropped. And then we clubbed it over the head with a rock and ate it. And that might take uh, uh, two days or three days. So we were, by nature, incredible endurance athletes. We've never powered our bodies with carbohydrates, and yet uh, we've been able to achieve uh, our success and are here today with the same genome uh, that is dedicated to using fat as a, a fuel source. So you must carb load and eat lots of carbs if you're basing your physiology and basically your metabolism on that notion. But when you keto adapt, meaning when you shift your metabolism over to one that recognizes or is able to use fat as a fuel source, and that may take a couple of weeks of being carbohydrate restricted while welcoming back fat to the table, then instead of tapping into the 2,000 calories of glycogen that you store in your liver and muscles, you're able to tap into 40,000 calories that are stored in your fat, and you've got this beautiful uh, oil lamp of a flame burning day in and day out that will power your body even through strenuous uh, extended workouts, which is what humans, again, are designed to do. So this relationship between diabetes and Alzheimer's uh, in terms not only of risk of developing Alzheimer's but the actual mechanisms in the brain that relate to insulin has caused people like myself to actually call Alzheimer's disease type 3 diabetes. I think it's really important that people recognize that the current diets people are on and, re and that are recommended are uh, so counter to what we have been eating for a long, long time. Step one, you've got to dramatically reduce your carbohydrates, uh, and I mean that's got to be dramatic, and step two is you've got to start eating good fats. There's no question that the ideal diet from a metabolic perspective and even from a, the perspective of speaking to your DNA is a diet that's rich in nutrients, uh, low in carbohydrates and high in good fats, you know, avoiding the bad fats, the trans fats and the modified fats. And, and one thing I really have to emphasize as we talk about the critical importance of a high fat diet, which this is, gratefully, but that doesn't mean all fats. You know, there are the trans fats, the hydrogenated modified fats that uh, sci have been scientized to extend their shelf life, which are like coffin nails. Uh, these things are the worst thing you can bring into your body. Devastating for brain health, devastating for your immune function, powerfully involved in increasing inflammation, the cornerstone of your uh, degenerative situation. So let's be real clear. We're talking about 
the olive oil, nuts and seeds, coconut oil, grass-fed beef, uh, wild, not farm-raised fish. Inflammation is something everyone's familiar with, whether it's the arthritic knee that is inflamed and therefore painful and swollen, or getting bitten by a bee where the, the place you get bitten is swollen and painful and red. But what people fail to understand and make the connection to is the role of inflammation in, for example, coronary artery disease. And from my perspective, how inflammation is actually the cornerstone of things like Alzheimer's and Parkinson's. Why don't you make the connection? It's because, you know, the brain doesn't have pain receptors. We don't know the brain is inflamed. But clearly, inflammation is playing a pivotal role and pro-inflammatory foods are, for example, the carbohydrates, which change our proteins and increase inflammation. And that is the direct relationship between carbohydrates and risk, for example, for Alzheimer's. Another important player are, for example, the omega-6 fats that are so in, in, in our society these days, not just from using these fats that are on the grocery store shelves, but eating foods like beet that has been fed grain, that dramatically increases the omega-6 to omega-3 ratio. So when you're eating grain-fed beef or eating eggs from grain-fed chicken, you're giving your body a powerful dose of omega-6s, increasing inflammation, and therefore increasing the very process that leads to coronary artery disease, diabetes, cancer, and even Alzheimer's. We're heading down the rocky road right now in terms of the health of Western cultures. And there's an old saying, if you don't change where you're going, you're going to end up getting there. And I really think that it's so important that people recognize that lifestyle choices are job one. We've got to change what people are eating. We've got to get this information out because the statistics showing where we're going in terms of heart disease, in terms of cancer, and in terms of Alzheimer's paints a picture that is really uh, not pretty at all. Uh, but we can change that. This glass can absolutely be half, half full as opposed to half empty. We can't afford where we're going. The emotional impact of where we're going is going to be uh, devastating for all of us. But the good news is that we've got the information right now to make these dramatic changes.